a town in Persia, there lived two brothers, one named Kasim, the other Ali Baba. Kasim was married to a rich wife and lived in plenty, while Ali Baba had to maintain his wife and children by cutting wood in a forest and selling it in town. One day, when Ali Baba was in the forest, he saw a troop of men on horseback coming towards him in a cloud of dust. He was afraid they were robbers, and he climbed into a tree for safety. When they came up and dismounted, he counted forty of them. They unbridled their horses and tied them to a tree. The finest man among them, whom Ali Baba took to be their captain, went a little way among some bushes and said, Open sesame, so plainly that Ali Baba heard him. A door opened in the rock, and having made the troop go in, he followed them, and the door shut again behind them. They stayed some time in the cave, and Ali Baba, fearing that they might come out and catch him, was forced to sit patiently in the tree. At last the door opened again, and they all passed by the captain one by one, and then he closed the door by saying, Shut, Sesame! Every man bridled his horse, mounted, and the captain put himself at their head, and they returned just as they had come. Then Ali Baba climbed down, and he went to the door concealed among the bushes, and he said, Open, Sesame! And it flew open. Ali Baba, who was expecting to find a dull, dismal place, was greatly surprised to find it large and well lighted, hollowed by the hand of man into the form of a vault, which received the light from an opening in the ceiling. He saw rich bales of merchandise, silk, stuff brocades all piled together in gold and silver and heaps and money in leather purses he went in and the door shut behind him he did not look at the silver but he brought out as many bags of gold as he thought his donkeys could carry and he loaded them with the bags and then put the wood on top of the bags using the words shut sesame he closed the door and went home and he drove his donkeys into the yard, shut the gates, carried the money bags into the house, and emptied them in front of his wife. He bade her to keep the secret, and that he would go and bury the gold. Let me at least first measure it, said his wife. I will go borrow a measure from someone while you dig the hole. So she ran to the wife of Cassim and borrowed a measure. Knowing Ali Baba's poverty, the sister was curious to find out what sort of grain that they wished to measure, and she artfully put some suet at the bottom of the measure. Ali Baba's wife went home and set the measure on the heap of gold and filled it and emptied it often, to her great content. She carried the measure back to her sister without noticing the piece of gold sticking to it, which Cassim's wife perceived directly as soon as her back was turned. She was very curious, and she said to Cassim when he came home, Cassim, your brother is richer than you are. He does not count his money. He measures it. He begged her to explain this riddle, which she did by showing him the piece of money and telling him where she found it. Then Cassim grew so envious that he could not sleep, and he went to his brother as soon as morning arose. Ali Baba, he said, showing him the gold piece, you pretend to be poor, and yet you measure your gold? By this, Ali Baba perceived that through his wife's folly, Kasim and his wife knew their secret. So he confessed all, and he offered Kasim a share. That I expect, said Kasim, but I must know where to find the treasure. Otherwise, I will discover all in you will lose all. Ali Baba, more out of kindness than fear, told him where the cave was and the words to use. Cassim left Ali Baba meaning to be up before him and to get the treasure for himself. He rose early the next morning and he set out with ten mules loaded with great chests. He soon found the place and the door to the rock and he said, Open sesame! And the door opened and shut behind him. He could have feasted his eyes on the treasure all day, but now he hastened to gather as much as possible. But when he was ready to go, he could not remember what to say for thinking of all his great riches. 
Instead of sesame, he said, open barley, and the door remained fast. He named several other sorts of grain, all but the right one, and the door stayed stuck. He was so frightened of the danger that he was in that he as had much forgotten the word as if he had never heard it in the first place. About noon, the robbers returned to their cave, and they saw Cassim's mules roving about with great chest tied to their back. This gave them the alarm. They drew their sabers. They went to the door, which opened on their captain, saying, Open Sesame. Cassim, who had heard the tramping of the horse's hoofs, resolved to sell his life dearly. So when the door opened, he leaped out and threw the captain down. In vain, however, for the robbers with their sabers soon killed him. On entering the cave, they saw all the bags laid ready, and they could not imagine how anyone could have gotten in without knowing their secret. They cut Cassim's body into four quarters and nailed them up inside the cave in order to frighten anyone who should venture in. Then they went away in search of more treasure. As night drew on, Cassim's wife grew very uneasy, and she ran to her brother-in-law and told him where her husband had gone. Ali Baba did his best to comfort her, and he set out to the forest in search of Cassim. The first thing he saw on entering the cave was his dead brother. Full of horror, he put the body on one of his donkeys, bags of gold on the other two, and covering all with some wood, returned home. He drove the two donkeys laden with gold into his yard, and he led the other to Cassim's house. The door was opened by Cassim's slave, whom he knew to be both brave and cunning. On loading the donkey, he said to her, This is the body of your master. He has been murdered, but we must bury him as though he died in bed. I will speak with you again, but now tell your mistress that I have come. The wife of Cassim, on learning the fate of her husband, broke out into cries and tears, but Ali Baba offered to take her to live with him and his wife, if she would promise to keep his counsel and leave everything to the slave, whereupon she agreed and dried her eyes. The slave, however, sought an apothecary, and asked him for some lozenges. My poor master, she said, can neither eat nor speak, and no one knows what is wrong with him. She carried home the lozenges and returned the next day weeping and asked for an essence given only to those just about to die. Thus in the evening no one was surprised to hear the wretched shrieks and cries of Cassim's wife and his slave, telling everyone that Cassim was dead. The day after the slave went to an old cobbler near the gate of the town, who opened a stall early and put a piece of gold in his hand, and bade him to follow her with needle and thread. Having bound his eyes with a handkerchief, she took him to the room where the body lay, pulled off the bandage, and bade him to sew the body back together, after which she covered his eyes again and led him home. Then they buried Cassim, and Morgiana, his slave, followed him to the grave, weeping and tearing her hair, while Cassim's wife stayed at home, uttering lamentable cries. The next day she went to live with Ali Baba, who gave Cassim's shop to his eldest son. The forty thieves, upon their return to the cave, were much astonished to find Cassim's body gone, as well as some of their money bags. We have certainly been discovered, said the captain, and we shall be undone if we cannot find out who it is that knows our secret. Two men must have known it. We have killed one, now we must find the other. To this end, one of you must be bold and artful and go into the city dressed as a traveler and discover whom it is we have killed and whether men talk of the strange manner of his death. If the messenger fails, he must lose his life, lest we be betrayed. One of the thieves started up and offered to do this, and after the rest had highly commended him for his bravery, he disguised himself and happened to enter the town at daybreak just by Baba Mustafa's stall. The thief bade him good day, saying, Honest man, how can you possibly see to stitch at your great old age? 
Old as I am, replied the cobbler, I have very good eyes. Will you believe me when I tell you that I sewed a dead body together in a place where I had less light than this? The robber was overjoyed at his good fortune, and giving him a piece of gold, he desired to be shown the house where he had stitched up the dead body. At first Mustafa refused, saying that he had been blindfolded, but when the robber gave him another piece of gold, he began to think he might remember the turnings if he were blindfolded as before. This means succeeded. The robber partly led him and partly was guided by him right to the front of Cassim's house, the door of which the robber marked with a piece of chalk. Then, well pleased, he bade farewell to Baba Mustafa and returned to the forest. By and by, Morgiana, going out, saw the mark the robber had made and quickly guessed that some mischief was brewing. She fetched a piece of chalk and marked two or three doors on each side without saying anything to her master or mistress. The thief, meantime, told his comrades of his discovery. The captain thanked him and bade him show them the house that he had marked. But when they came to the town, they found that five or six houses had the same mark. The guide was so confounded that he knew not what to answer, and when they returned to camp, he was beheaded for having failed. Another robber was dispatched, and having won over Baba Mustafa, he marked the house in red chalk. But Morgiana, again being too clever for them, the second messenger was put to death also. The captain now resolved to go himself, but wiser than the others, he did not mark the house, but looked at it so closely that he could not fail but to remember it. He returned and he ordered his men to go into the neighboring village and to buy nineteen mules and thirty-eight leather jars, all empty except one which was to be full of oil. The captain put one of his men fully armed into each, rubbing the outside of the jar with oil from the full vessel. Then the nineteen mules were loaded with thirty-seven robbers and jars and the jar of oil, and they reached the town by dusk. The captain stopped his mules in front of the house of Ali Baba, and said to Ali Baba, who was sitting outside for the cool air, I have brought some oil from some distance to sell tomorrow at the market, but it is now so late I know not where to pass the night, unless you will do me the favor of taking me in. Though Ali Baba had seen the captain of the robbers in the forest, he did not recognize him in the disguise of an oil merchant. He bade him welcome, opened his gates for him, allowed the mules to enter, and went to Morgiana to bid her prepare a bed and supper for his guest. He brought the stranger into his hall, and after they had supped, he went again to speak to Morgiana in the kitchen, while the captain went to the yard under the pretense of seeing after his mules but really to tell his men what to do. Beginning at the first jar and ending at the last, he said to each man, As soon as I throw some stones from the window of the chamber where I lie, cut the jars open with your knives and come out, and I will be with you in a trice. He returned to the house, and Morgiana led him to his chamber. She then told Abdallah, her fellow slave, to set on the pot to make some broth for her master, who had gone to bed. Meanwhile, her lamp went out, and she had no more oil in the house. Do not be uneasy, said Abdal. Go into the yard. Take some of it out of one of those jars. Morgiana thanked him for his advice, took the oil pot, and went into the yard. When she came to the first jar, the robber inside said softly, Is it time yet? Any other slave but Morgiana, on finding a man in the jar instead of the oil she wanted, would have screamed and made a noise. But she, knowing the danger her master was in, thought of a plan, and she answered quietly, Not yet, but presently. She went to all the jars, giving the same answer, till she came to the last jar of oil. She now saw that her master, thinking he was entertaining an oil merchant, had let thirty-eight robbers into his house. She filled her oil pot and went back into the kitchen. Having lit her lamp, she went again to the oil jar and filled a large kettle full of oil. 
When it boiled, she went and poured enough into every jar to stifle and kill a robber inside. When this brave deed was done, she went back to the kitchen, put out the fire and the lamp, and waited to see what would happen. In a quarter of an hour, the captain of the robbers awoke, got up, and opened the window. As all seemed to be quiet, he threw down some little pebbles which hit the jars. He listened, but none of his men seemed to be stirring. He grew uneasy, and he went down into the yard. On going to the first jar, he said, Are you asleep? He smelled the hot boil. He knew at once that his plot to murder Ali Baba and his household had been discovered. He found all of his gang was dead, and missing the oil out of the last jar, he became aware of the manner of their death. He then forced the lock of a door leading into a garden, and climbing over several walls, he made his escape. Morgiana heard and saw all this, and rejoicing at her success, went to bed and fell asleep. At daybreak, Ali Baba arose, and seeing the oil jar still there, he asked why the merchant had not gone with his mules. Morgiana bade him to look in the first jar and see if there was any oil. Seeing a man, he started back in terror. Have no fear, said Morgiana. This man cannot harm you. He is dead. Ali Baba, when he had recovered somewhat from his astonishment, asked what had become of the merchant. Merchant, said she. He is no more a merchant than I am. She told him the whole story, assuring him that it was a plot of the robbers of the forest, of whom only three were left, and that the white and red chalk marks had something to do with it. Ali Baba at once gave Morgiana her freedom, saying that he owed her his life. They then buried the bodies in Ali Baba's garden, while the mules were sold in the market by his slaves. The captain returned to his lonely cave, which seemed frightful to him without his companions, and he firmly resolved to avenge them by killing Ali Baba. He dressed himself carefully and went into town, where he took his lodgings at an inn. In the course of a great many journeys to the forest, he carried away many rich stuffs and much fine linen, and he set up a shop opposite that of Ali Baba's son. He called himself Kajia Hassan, and as he was both civil and well-dressed, he soon made friends with Ali Baba's son and threw him with Ali Baba, whom he was continually asking to sup with him. Ali Baba, wishing to return his kindness, invited him into his house and received him smiling, thanking him for his kindness to his son. When the merchant was about to take his leave, Ali Baba stopped him and said, Where are you going, sir, in such haste? Will you not stay and sup with me? The merchant refused. The merchant replied, saying that he had a reason, and on Ali Baba's asking him what, he replied, It is, sir, that I can eat no victuals that have any salt in them. Oh, if that is all, said Ali Baba, let me tell you, there shall be no salt in either the meat or the bread that we eat tonight. He went and gave this order to Morgiana, who was much surprised. Who is this man, she said, who eats no salt with his meat? He is an honest man, Morgiana, returned her master. Therefore, do as I bid you. But she could not withstand a desire to see this strange man, so she helped Abdallah to carry up the dishes, and she saw in a moment that Kajia Hassan was the robber captain. She carried a dagger under her garment. I am not surprised, she said to herself, that this wicked man who intends to kill my master will eat no salt with him, that I will hinder his plans. She sent up the supper by Abdallah, while she made ready for one of the boldest acts that could be thought of. When the dessert had been served, Kajia Hassan was left alone with Ali Baba and his son, whom he thought to make drunk, and then to murder them. Morgiana, meanwhile, put on a headdress like a dancing girl's, and clasped a girdle round her waist, from which hung a dagger with a silver hilt, and she said to Abdallah, Take your tabor, and let us go and divert our master and his guest. Abdallah then took his tabor and played before Morgiana, and they came to the door, 
where Abdallah stopped playing, and Morgiana made a low curtsy. Come in, Morgiana, said Ali Baba, and let Kojia Hassan see what you can do. And turning to Kojia Hassan, he said, She is my slave and also my housekeeper. Kajia Hassan was by no means pleased, for he feared that his chance of killing Ali Baba was gone for the present, but he pretended great eagerness to see Morgiana, and Abdallah began to play, and Morgiana began to dance. After she had performed several dances, she drew her dagger and made passes with it, sometimes pointing it at her own breast, sometimes at her master's, as if it were part of the dance. Suddenly, out of breath, she snatched the devour from Abdallah with her left hand, and holding the dagger in her right hand, she held the devour out to her master. Ali Baba and his son each put a piece of gold into it, and Kajia Hassan, sensing that she was coming to him, pulled out his purse to make her a present. But while he was putting his hand into it, Morgiana plunged the dagger into his heart. Unhappy girl! cried Ali Baba and his son. What have you done to ruin us? It was to preserve you, master, not to ruin you, answered Morgiana. See here, opening the false merchant's garment and showing the dagger. See what an enemy you have entertained? Remember, he would eat no salt with you. What more would you have? Look at him. He is both the false oil merchant and the captain of the forty thieves. Ali Baba was so grateful to Morgiana for thus saving his life that he offered her to his son in marriage, who readily consented, and a few days after the wedding was celebrated with the greatest splendor. At the end of a year, Ali Baba, after hearing nothing more of the two remaining robbers, judged that they were dead, and he set out to the cave. The door opened upon his saying, Open Sesame. He went in and saw that nobody had been there since the captain had left it. He brought away as much gold as he could carry and returned to town. He told his son the secret of the cave, which his son handed down to his son. So the children and grandchildren of Ali Baba were rich to the end of their lives.